starting off. Starting off, uh, Roman numeral number one it are things that you should know right now. Okay? So, Roman numeral one, here's some energy and changes in matter. First, what did we say that energy was? What's our definition of energy or how do we discuss it? The ability to do damage or more generally the ability to change stuff, make things different. Okay? And we said that, and we made a point that in the, in the process of bond making, right, in the process of chemical bonding, um, generally what happens energy-wise? Heat is given off, yes, which means that our reactions are generally classified as what? Exothermic, right? Because bond formation is a process of what? What are things doing when they're bonding with one another? They're trying to become more what? Less energy, which results in more stability. Okay? So, let's fill out the first two, right? Uh, energy and change in matter. Okay? A, exothermic. Energy is released at what? Uh, let's, go with, let's go with heat for exothermic. Okay? You'll notice underneath that exergonic is a term that we did introduce later on. And that's energy released in something other than heat, generally light. Okay? And then on the other hand, for part B, or for section B, right, when heat is added to a substance, what do we refer to that as? Endothermic, right? Okay, so for B, that should be endothermic. And then endergonic, energy added to a reaction in something other than the form of light, or, or something other than the form of heat. Okay. The one example that I think of, because I'm a science teacher, I think of the world this way. Um, anybody uh, recently have a filling at the dentist office? Anybody yeah. Had a filling? So, I got ceilings. Yeah, I'm thinking more. I don't know if they do it with ceilings. I'm thinking more about filling. Like they put the filling in, and then the little hygienist lady has the little light pen. Yeah, they oh, do that. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I, weird. Again? <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. a blue light. Yeah. So it's what's so happening nice. there? is that she's providing ultraviolet light. Well, she, okay. There, I'm assuming there are male hygienists out there. I've never seen one, but I'm assuming. <laughs> you know. um, but that, that light pen is providing ultraviolet light to the chemicals that make up that filler. And it's causing a reaction. And that's what causes it to be, to become more solid, to become hard, you know, to be like your teeth. Basically like that. So we have a, a, a reaction that needs something other than heat to make it go. Okay? Another reaction that needs something other than heat to make it go, that's uh, happening quite frequently now, but wasn't happening two weeks ago. Okay? Photosynthesis. Okay? Photosynthesis doesn't need heat, it needs light. Okay? Those are both endergonic reactions. I think, right? uh, there? Yes. Definitely. So a lot of times, as when a lot of times, exothermic and exergonic occur at the same time. That we're giving off energy in more than one form, but just generally we refer to the heat. Generally, you know, they a lot of times we'll see that they happen simultaneously, but we refer to the heat part of exothermic, the, the therm part. You can say that you can, you can say that energy was released more generally out of that. Don't get too caught up on that. I'll be okay with that. All right. Not really sure why that's opening. All right. So let's go back here. Let's get the slideshow and we'll go. Okay. Here are two graphs, and we notice that on the x-axis it's labeled as reaction which is kind of generic, um, we could change that x-axis to time, although we're talking about more in the process of a chemical reaction. And then the y-axis in both of these graphs is labeled as chemical energy. Okay? So which one of those pictures represents an exothermic reaction and which one represents an endothermic reaction? Okay. Endothermic being the one on the right, okay? If we look at where our reactants and products start, 
Which one ends up with more energy? Well, sorry. In, ter in terms of the second graph, right, if we look at reactants and products, which one ends up with more energy? Products ends up with more energy. That's an endothermic reaction. Heat absorbed. Over here on this side, right, reactants up here, products down here, okay, products end up with less energy than reactants do. Yes, yes. Okay. Good question. Why would endothermic ever happen? In actuality, it's not entirely energy that governs what happens out there in nature. There's a couple other factors that go into it. Things like entropy and things like Gibbs free energy, which are topics that we haven't talked about in this class. Can we talk about them? Um, they're beyond the scope of your understanding at this point in time. So, well, probably not, but, okay. But, Edwin, there's other things that go in there, and that there are certain things that, there are certain situations where even though reactants or products end up with more energy than reactants, because of the other factors that go into it, it will still happen out there in nature, okay? Example, um, one of those little uh, instant ice pack things that are in like first aid kits, you know what I'm talking about, right? You pop the little bu bubble and you shake it together, it gets cold. That's an endothermic reaction. The reason it feels cold is because energy is flowing into it, but that's got to come from somewhere. When you put it on your skin, where does it come from? Where does that energy that's flowing into that reaction come from? It comes from you. And that's why it feels cold, okay? Because it's absorbing energy. But there's got to be other factors because energy doesn't work that way, right? Generally, things are looking for lower energy. But there's other things that go into it, okay? So that's that's why sometimes we have reactions that are endothermic that do occur naturally. Okay? But on the other hand, right, reactive products, okay, get this here. The reason I bring this picture up is because when you look at the graph, right, especially the exothermic one, okay, reactants start at a certain level. But then what happens to energy, at least initially? It increases, okay? A lot of times, reactions won't happen unless we give them a little push, okay? For example, the synthesis reaction that was in your lab, okay? Magnesium reacting with what? Oxygen, okay? To form magnesium oxide. There's oxygen in this room, right? There's no more magnesium in this room because I actually cleaned up the lab instead of waiting three weeks to do it like I usually do, but, you know, whatever. But when I put a piece of magnesium on the table, does it spontaneously give off that big bright light? No. Okay? Magnesium and oxygen, the way they are, naturally, there's some kind of stability there. That's why they settled that way. But if we give them a little push, like the energy from the burner, they can rearrange themselves into a much more stable situation. Okay? This little push sometimes, what we need to get it over that big hill, and then we just roll downhill and we end up with less energy than we started with, even though it won't necessarily happen spontaneously. Does that make sense? Another example, right? Um, dun, 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 dun. Lost my train of thought. Okay. Oh, the uh, zinc and the hydrochloric acid reaction, okay? You put the zinc in the test tube, you put the hydrochloric acid in. What starts happening? <coughs> bubbles. What are those bubbles? Yeah. Not CO2 gas, hydrogen gas, right? So there's hydrogen gas being created, okay? What else is in the air? We've already established that what kind of gas is in the air. Oxygen, right? If you put hydrogen and oxygen together, what should you make? Water. But does it spontaneously happen? No. What happens is you bring that little burning splint in, right? That's the little push that the hydrogen and oxygen need to get over the, you know, to get over the hill and end up down at a much more stable situation of water. Yes, sir? Is the push kind of like reaction normally would do? Like a lot of times, yes, although not always. And we'll talk about why not in just a second. 
It's any kind of energy. A lot of times that's heat, but not always. Okay. Jenna, go ahead. No, the splint adds the energy. Because what is so? What is this? What is the splint doing? Yes, if you if you look inside the test tube, you can see little drops of water that form on the inside of the test tube. Okay. I didn't have you guys look at that because now we're getting into multiple things. You know, we're trying to isolate certain parts of it. But yeah, if you, if you watch it happen, you'll see little drops of water up here on the inside of the test tube. No, you don't have to worry about that. Because yeah. Jenna, that's getting into a different type of reaction, right? That's a combustion reaction and a synthesis reaction. But really, that experiment is more focused on single replacement reaction. Okay. Excellent. Uh, one of the questions about the uh, you have to answer all the questions about the hat sheet. What was one of the questions? What happened with the words? That's more the pop that I'm looking for, okay? The pop is the sound that the react is it's a reaction that's occurring. It's the sound of that, uh, that hydrogen expanding real quick as it reacts with the oxygen. It's like thunder, basically. Like, you know, that, you know, it creates that, it creates that energy given off like that, that makes the sound. No, mostly the pop is a test for hydrogen gas. Okay, so what we're doing there is that we know that we started off with zinc. This is, you know, this is lab stuff. Okay, we know we started off with zinc and hydrochloric acid. Okay. And then the popping noise indicates that hydrogen was there by itself. So then knowing the pattern, we then have to go, okay, well, that means that we must end up with zinc. Zinc chloride, that must be the other one because of the single replacement. So the popping noise is more of a test for hydrogen, which then indicates, okay, hydrogen by itself now, it used to be joined with chlorine, so that means single replacement reaction must have occurred. Must have The, um, the, uh, the little ice pack thing to the first aid kit, you know, but to get that started, right, first you have to pop the bubble, that just gets those things together, but then what does it tell you to do after you pop the bubble? You shake it, right? So here's who asked the question about the, is it always heat, okay? Shaking, right? That's giving that little oomph to make it go. Will it go on its own if we just sort of sit them together? Yeah, but the shaking makes it happen a little faster. Does that make sense? Amy, go ahead. Let's kind of go back to the lab. Okay. So, so like you were saying, you know, we have to say, like, uh, what evidence that kind of motivation triggers. Okay. So, could you say, like, that's one of them, like, make the popping noise that you know is these guys? Technically, that's a separate chemical reaction. Yeah. That's chemical reaction between the hydrogen and oxygen. But the chemical reaction that you were technically observing was the reaction between the zinc and the hydrochloric acid. So can you include that or no? Um, you can at least in, definitely in the observation section, okay? When you're talking about your conclusion, you can say that it happened, but like I said, that popping noise is more of a test for hydrogen. So that's more proving that this happened here. Yeah. Does that make sense? I'm not so worried about the reaction with the hydrogen and the oxygen. That pop is, yeah, it's more.